throttling up. Three engines now at 104%. Challenger. The worst going. disaster in the history of spaceflight. The space shuttle Challenger blows apart, killing all seven people on board. One minute, 15 seconds. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. Tonight from Washington, D.C., it was a nightmare, a cruel, shocking end to what everyone expected to be another triumph for the space shuttle program. The Challenger, with a schoolteacher and six regular astronauts on board, was consumed by a giant fireball explosion less than two minutes after it was launched into the bright blue Florida skies at 11.38 Eastern Time this morning. The path to space was filled with debris and with death. All seven people were killed. High technology, which we take so often for granted, turned on us. It was a tremendous loss, a blow so cruel, so unexpected, we're still trying to deal with it. The victims, Flight Commander Francis Dick Scobie. He had flown in Vietnam, 46 years old. He leaves a wife and two children. Navy Commander Michael Smith, the pilot, also a Vietnam veteran, 40 years old, a wife and three children. Mission Specialist Ronald McNair, a physicist, was 36 years old. One of four blacks in the program, he leaves a wife and two children. Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Onizuka was an Air Force test pilot, 39 years old. The first Japanese American to go into space, he leaves a wife and two small children. Electrical engineer Dr. Judith Resnick was 36 years old, a veteran of another space flight. She was single. Payload Specialist Gregory Jarvis was an engineer for Hughes Aircraft, 41 years old. He leaves a wife. And the seventh crew member, New Hampshire school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, 37 years old. She leaves a husband and two children. They all died today in the worst accident ever to befall space explorers anywhere. NBC's Dan Molina was covering the launch from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. It was a bitter cold but sparkling clear morning at Cape Canaveral. Here at the last seconds of the countdown. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. All the communications between the shuttle and mission control indicated everything was going fine. There was a sense of relief that the much delayed flight was finally underway. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. It happened just over one minute into flight. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. From mission control, silence. Then the bland, chilling report. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Slow motion. A search effort couldn't begin for some 15 minutes after this. Debris, they said, just kept raining from the sky. The head of the space shuttle program had no explanations, just sorrow at the tragedy. At 11.40 a.m. this morning, space program experienced a national tragedy with the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger approximately a minute and a half after launch from here at the Kennedy Space Center. Computer-enhanced video shows the explosion in detail. What explosion appears to happen at the rear of the spacecraft, around the main engines, perhaps in one of the two solid rocket boosters? Then a blast higher up. The shuttle was instantly a blazing fireball. NASA has appointed a committee of top engineers and scientists to investigate the catastrophe. Orders have been issued to impound all records concerning the flight, down to the personal notes of all the flight controllers. Dan Molina, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. And from ground level on Cape Canaveral, today's disaster was witnessed by thousands of people. Among them were space officials, technicians, and the families of the astronauts. Steve Delaney was on the scene to cover the launch for NBC News. The day began in optimism and high spirits after the frustration of yesterday's scrubbed countdown. 
As the crew suited up to enter the Challenger, one of the technicians there revived an old schoolboy tradition and brought an apple to the teacher. For the McAuliffe family and the families of the other six crew members, this was to be a triumphant day. Grace and Ed Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts were in the VIP bleachers along with their daughter Lisa to watch their daughter Krista become the school teacher in space. Their faces mirrored what happened a little more than a minute into the flight. The families have been secluded in the astronauts quarters at the space center since just after the accident. In nearby Titusville, where the manned space program is the economy, the shock hit hard. I just started crying and, and backed up and walked away because I knew it was really bad. I wonder if anybody could be salvaged, you know, from something like that. That was really the first thing that went through my head. Vice President George Bush arrived here late in the day, heading a delegation bearing the nation's condolences to the families. You must try to understand that spirit bravery and commitment are what make not only the space program but all of life worthwhile we must never as people in our daily lives or as a nation stop exploring stop hoping stop discovering we must press on there was a search in the atlantic but the searchers found so little that late in the afternoon nasa conceded there was no indication of survivors but that conclusion had been foreshadowed an hour earlier when the flag at the launch site was lowered to half-staff. Steve Delaney, NBC News at the Kennedy Space Center. NBC science correspondent Robert Bazell has been covering the space shuttle flight since this program began. He's at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena tonight. And Bob, we were talking earlier, you were a friend of Dick Scobie. He had a premonition that something like this would happen someday, didn't he? That's right, uh, Tom. Dick Scobie worked with us on, on several of the missions, and in one in particular, I remember him telling me that one of, the di one of these days the space shuttle was going to blow up. He said it was a large, complex piece of machinery with a lot of explosives, enough to get it going to 17,000 miles an hour to get it into orbit. He said, just like if you take enough airplane flights and eventually an airplane is going to crash, he said someday that's going to happen to the space shuttle. And he said, I certainly hope that when that does happen, it doesn't bring the shuttle program to an end. Well, what about that? Do you think that the shuttle program obviously now has been frozen in place for a time, you think that we'll have to re-examine the whole concept of the shuttle? Well, certainly, they're going to have to find out what happened and until they can allow another shuttle flight to go up, and that is going to bring the entire shuttle program to a halt until they do. Right now, they're beginning a process called failure analysis, where they will try in detail, looking at those pictures we've just seen, looking at other pictures, looking at all the data that came from the spacecraft, to try to learn what went wrong, to try, if possible, in some laboratory to recreate the accident. One of the hypotheses, and it's just a hypothesis we've learned, is that a fan, a piece of fan in the main engine came apart, a piece of metal, and that flew into the main fuel tank. That's one of the, the very strong possibilities right now, but as I said, it's only a hypothesis, and it'll take a lot of analysis to find out exactly what the problem was. Okay, Bob, and that uh, main fuel tank, of course, contains a half million gallons of highly volatile liquid oxygen and hydrogen, and so it is an explosive bomb, in effect, that is propelling the shuttle into space. Our coverage of this space shuttle disaster will continue with reports on the men and women who lost their lives today, the reaction of President Reagan, and the school children that Krista McAuliffe left behind. Her little girl said that she didn't want her mommy to go into space. But Krista McAuliffe was a teacher, after all, and a ride on the shuttle was the ultimate field trip. She wanted to bring the wonder and excitement of space back to her high school students in Concord, New Hampshire. And as NBC's Fred Briggs reports now, they were waiting and watching. Her students were counting down with her. When they saw the explosion, there was confusion. Was something wrong? The principal and teachers weren't certain either. Then it got very quiet as the horror of it began to register. Would everybody please go back to class at this time? They did go back for a while, but at 1 o'clock, school was closed. It had to close. I felt as if uh, my whole body blew up inside when I saw that. And I can just never be as shocked as I am now.
The students went home while the faculty and principal, Krista McAuliffe's colleagues, tried to collect themselves. We were enjoying the entire event. We were celebrating with her. Then it stopped. That's all. It just stopped. She had talked to her students in recent months about reaching for the stars. And now those students, members of the faculty, and her friends are reaching deep within themselves and trying to understand. Her training for the mission was shared with her students. She once told them that space exploration was in the future of every child. It was that kind of positive philosophy that led to her selection. She was one of ten teachers chosen as finalists. It's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. When she left her husband and two children in New Hampshire for Houston, her six-year-old daughter Caroline wasn't very happy about it. Why wasn't she? Because I don't want to go in space because I just want to stay around my house. But she wanted to go for her family, her friends, her students, and the teachers who were runners-up. When that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Fred Briggs, NBC News, Concord, New Hampshire. Last July, in an interview with New York radio station WNBC, Krista McAuliffe was asked if she had any fears about her space shuttle flight. People really feel that space travel is safe now. It, it's not that earlier feeling that, oh, it's going to blow up or something's going to happen. The shuttle is a, a really good, safe program. Right at this point, I feel that I'll be okay if I go up. Of course, McCullough's six colleagues formed the backbone of this mission. Four of them were veterans of previous shuttle flights. They represented a cross-section of the country. They were born in North Carolina and Hawaii, Washington State and Ohio, South Carolina, Michigan. NBC's Bob Jamison looks at their lives in the space program. These are the faces of the tragedy. As the Challenger astronauts walked to the shuttle this morning, dreams, not tragedy, may have been foremost in their minds. This was the first space flight for 41-year-old Gregory Jarvis, a Hughes Aircraft Company engineer. Uh, I've been charged up since uh, last March, and so this is kind of a culmination of a dream come true. 36-year-old Ronald McNair was proud of the pictures he took in space. McNair said he had dreamed about being an astronaut when he was in high school. But growing up poor in South Carolina, McNair never thought this would come true. You know, where I came from, you know, that wasn't the kind of thing a black kid thought about. You know, I pursued science with that in my mind, and uh, it wasn't until recently that I saw a break to make a dream, you know, come true. McNair is survived by his wife and a son three, a daughter one. 36-year-old Judy Resnick often said she had confidence in NASA's safety record, even though she had to scramble from discovery when liftoff for her first mission was scrubbed because the engine shut down after ignition. Resnick was single, a classical pianist with a Ph.D. in engineering who had found her life's work in space. I'd like to stay with the space program as long as they want me um, as an astronaut if I can, and if not, I'd like to stay in some other capacity because I think it's very important. 39-year-old Air Force Colonel Ellison Onizuka was the first Japanese-American in space. He leaves a wife and two children. I'd certainly like to stay in the program as, as, as long as I can, as, as long as I can contribute to it and, uh, and be a part of it. Uh. Challenger pilot Mike Smith, 40, tested planes for the Navy before he became an astronaut. This was his first space mission. Well, I, I am excited, and I, I guess I look at it like I look at flying new airplanes. Uh. Commander Francis Scobie was idolized in Washington State where he grew up. This was Scobie's second shuttle mission, and he prophetically told friends that such a tragedy as today's was possible. And we do these flights repetitively, and they get kind of a, a commonplaceness to them that's really not there because each one of them is an individual technological marvel in itself, and you lose that by watching so many of them. There are a lot of things that go on during space flight, and it's not easy to do, and, it's, and it may look easy from the outside. It's not easy from the inside. Bob Jamison, NBC News, New York. A footnote about Krista McAuliffe, she received a gift from the space division of Caroon and Black, that's a New York insurance broker. It gave her a $1 million personal accident policy for this shuttle flight. An official of the company said the money should be paid to the McAuliffe family within a few days. President Reagan learned about the space explosion while preparing for his State of the Union speech, which was scheduled for tonight. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Chris Wallace reports on the rest of the President's Day and the reaction as the news spread throughout Washington today. 
speak to you tonight to report... The president was no different from any other American today, watching the tragic news on television. Late this afternoon, he addressed the nation about what he called a traumatic experience. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Mr. Reagan talked directly to the school children who watched the launch, saying the future belongs not to the faint-hearted, but the brave. And he emphasized today's accident will not stop the space program. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Vice President Bush and the acting head of NASA were sent to Cape Canaveral to talk to the families and launch an investigation. But officials said Mr. Reagan has full confidence in the space agency. The president was to make his State of the Union speech tonight and planned to go ahead even after the accident, saying, you can't stop governing the nation. But congressional leaders told the White House there was no interest in politics tonight. So Mr. Reagan canceled. Let us remember in silent prayer those who were involved in the spacecraft shuttle accident just a few minutes ago off Florida. On Capitol Hill, the House met for a brief prayer and then adjourned. But members of Congress wanted to talk. Some had ridden the shuttle themselves, like Utah Senator Garn. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. Congressman in charge of shuttle funding said the program will go on, but only after a full investigation. There may be delays that could uh, go on for, for as much as a year with regard to future uh, shuttle launches. The president was going to mention the shuttle tonight in his State of the Union speech as an example of American progress. Instead, he had to deliver a eulogy to the Challenger crew, calling them pioneers on the last frontier. Chris Wallace, NBC News, at the White House. This terrible event has touched the hearts of Americans all across the country, of course, and we'll have a report on how this nation reacted when we return. From coast to coast, people watched replays of the shuttle Challenger's destruction in the skies today, and they reacted with disbelief and sorrow. There could have been a tearing when the rocket went into great acceleration, its fastest point. The only thing I could think about with those kids in that auditorium and the trauma they must be going and what a shock it must be for them to watch something like that happen to their teacher. That's what I was thinking of. Really makes you sick to your stomach is the only way that I can explain my feeling. I was sick to my stomach. I was hurt. As a, an American, I was hurt. I feel, I still feel it within, in my heart that we've had a great loss. I felt like every one of them was my sons and daughters. I really did. Triumph has marked and tragedy has marred America's space effort in the past. With each success, new heights were set. With each failure came a resolve to continue. And as NBC's Gary Cutley tells us now, the American spirit remains undaunted by the magnitude of even today's disaster. From the moment the Wright brothers proved it could be done, challenging the law of gravity has captured the imagination and exacted a human price. The Hindenburg disaster came to symbolize that. Man was not meant to fly, skeptics said, but did. Was not meant to break the sound barrier, but did. Flew higher and faster until there was only space to conquer. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The space program too began with failures, to some a warning that man had met his limit. But technology triumphed, John Glenn orbited the earth and came home a hero. For behind the coal technology, it has always been the human spirit which has driven man into space. There were losses, three astronauts killed during a launch pad exercise in 1967, and there was the ultimate triumph. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then there was today, an epitaph for seven Americans, written large and hauntingly on a beautiful blue sky. Senator John Glenn has been there. I guess in our human existence there is triumph and there is tragedy. And uh, man tries many things. 
and uh, we advance as a whole human race because we because we succeed most of the time we make advances whether it's in space or engineering or health or medical things sometimes though we aren't perfect and then there's a tragedy that uh, brings us back to our own human frailties but as we contemplate our frailty, we have also been fascinated by pictures from Uranus and its moons two billion miles away. Pictures from Voyager showing new worlds to discover and explore. Can there be any doubt that one day, despite the risk, man will follow? Garrick Utley, NBC News. We'll have a special report on this Challenger tragedy tonight on NBC at 10, 9 central time. Now, if you'll permit me some personal thoughts. As we try, all of us, to rise above our grief, we struggle for words, for thoughts that may get us through this dark day, but everything seems to be so inadequate. What plays again and again in my mind is this. Great enterprises require great risks. The men and women who died today knew that. They were the risk takers. They believed in the physical and intellectual challenge of space flight, and in that, they were an extension of all of us. We rode with them. They gave courage to even the most timid among us. Now, we share the grief of their friends and families. The shock will pass, of course, as great as it is. Their spirit will live on. Their adventurous ways will be picked up and carried on by others. And the frontiers of space and knowledge will be expanded. And finally, to those families, as we shared your pride, we share your sorrow. I'm Tom Brokaw. Good night from all of us at NBC News.